morning, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Uh, this is another Penelope Melson Society event. I'm John Furling. I'm president of the Melson Society. It's a 10-year-old uh, society that's a Friends of the Library organization. And among the things that we do is try to make the library the hub of the, the campus. And we try to do that in part by sponsoring talks by faculty members and hosting uh, exhibits, which reminds me that in three weeks, uh, we will be hosting a very big exhibit on Americans in World War I. We're right now at the 100th anniversary of the armistice of World War I, or at least we'll be there by November 11th, and we'll have a speaker from California, a noted historian who's written three books on uh, Americans in World War I, Jennifer Keene, who will be here on October 25th. So keep an eye out for posters uh, and announcements about that, and I hope that you'll be able to uh, attend both the exhibit and uh, Professor Keene's uh, talk on the 25th. Let me now uh, introduce uh, Dean Beth Shepard, who will introduce our speaker. Good morning. On behalf of the faculty and staff of the Ingram Library, I would like to welcome you all to a facility that is the heart of campus. It is a facility that is a building but the true gist of the library are the student patrons, our community patrons, but above all, the employees who are the immense gift that this library has to share with the university. We are grateful to the Penelope Melzen Society, which made this event possible, and to the many, many people who contribute to make it a success from the facilities crew who made certain the building sparkles, to Brittany Purnell, our events coordinator, to the circulation team who remain unflappable about holding an event during a busy time of the morning. And there are many others who are unnamed besides. Thank you. Let's give them all a round of applause. Now, it is my utmost pleasure to introduce one of the Ingram Library's shining jewels, Ms. Shawnee Moraine. Ms. Moraine joined our ranks in 2016 as University Archivist and Assistant Professor. After having served as Director of the Library Services and Seminary Archivist at Payne Theological School in Ohio. She holds dual master's degrees, a divinity degree from Drew Theological School and an MLS from North Carolina Central. She's a sought after speaker and leader in the library profession and serves on the board of directors of the American Theological Library Association and as vice president of the Society of Georgia Archivists. She was recently recognized here at the University of West Georgia as the Best of the West Faculty Member of the Year. She cares deeply about every individual who crosses her path, which makes her passionate about preserving their past. She has this to say about her work, quote, as university archivist, my work primarily involves capturing, preserving, and making accessible content that is administratively and culturally significant to our campus, the stories of university life. Here now to share some of the history of University of West Georgia, it is my privilege to turn the podium over to Shawnee Moraine, who will be speaking about our history. Following the talk, there will be time for question and answers, as well as a brief period where you all may join in and share your stories and memories of the school. Please join with me in giving our speaker a hearty welcome. Thank you, Dr. Shepard. Good morning, students, staff, faculty, and alumni gathered here today for a lecture on the history of UWG. 
I'd like to welcome members of the Penelope Melson Society and extend a special greeting to Dr. Ferling, who invited me to speak on this topic after the 50 years of Ingram Library celebration last spring. So thank you, Dr. Ferling. Before we launch in today's talk, uh, let's first acknowledge that the University of West Georgia is on the traditional land of the Muskegee Creek people and that the campus is located on the former site of the Bonner Plantation where enslaved people of African descent lived and worked. Special Collections holds various primary source materials documenting the history and experiences of people indigenous and enslaved in the West Georgia region. As Beth said, just two years ago, I became UWG's first university archivist, a faculty position devoted to collecting, preserving, and making accessible content that is administratively and culturally significant to our campus. I delight in hearing folk talk and share their stories of their lives. As campus historian, I collaborate with departments across the university and in the local community on tours, preservation workshops, and course instruction incorporating historical items from our rich university archives collections. I enjoy teaching and storytelling with primary source materials and encouraging diverse groups to think deeply and differently about what they've been told, what they think they know, and what has yet to be revealed. This semester marks my second time teaching a first year seminar course on UWG campus history. I want to acknowledge the 20 XIDS 2002 What Do You Know About Campus History students who are in the audience today. Y'all wanna stand so we can see you? That looks to be about 15, <laughs> but I see you. Um, these students chose to pursue a college education at UWG from far-flung places such as Perkasi, Pennsylvania, to Conyers, to Kennesaw, to Tucker, to Chattooga County, is that right Avery? Avery? Yep. And right here in Carrollton. Together this semester, we are exploring the cultural, social, and political foundations of UWG and creating a social media campaign that connects past, present, and hopefully future generations of UWG students. Students are learning how to conduct archival research while considering the question of which materials and experiences get archived and why. The theoretical purpose of the course is to learn primary source literacy and our practical purpose is to relate campus history to their lives as new members of the UWG community. And we're having fun doing so thus far, right? All right, nodding your heads. I also want to acknowledge and thank the five graduate research students who process papers, interpret, curate exhibits, and create teaching guides in our four major collecting areas and special collections. This fall, we have Laurel Durham, Brian Lord, Erin Wright, Layla Manley, and Galen Rome serving as valuable members of the Special Collections team, and we thank them for all that they do. A lecture on the history of UWG is an invitation to hear a story. Shared stories help define a community. Every culture has its own stories or narratives which are shared as a means of entertainment, education, cultural preservation, or instilling moral values. Stories are what motivate us to live, innovate, and act. So what stories constitute the West Georgia culture? Who are our sources and how have they told these stories over time? When, where, and why are these stories told? And what do they tell us about who we are, what we believe, and what we are capable of? This morning, I will very briefly trace the history of UWG from the complex and fascinating history of its institution as it evolved from the agricultural and mechanical school to a doctoral granting university. Together, we will appreciate the evol evolution of the university and the strides it has taken to become inclusive and safer for all audience. And let me just say that condensing such a long history into a 45 minute talk is difficult, so I will be sure to leave some things out, but I hope that our uh, reflection period afterwards invites you to share uh, these new lenses that you've encountered to consider our history through. And I will also share information about my work to capture student life in the archives going forward, particularly through the initiative your organization lives on. But first, I want to know, what do we already know about UWG history? True or false? 
Love Valley was once a lake. True. And I'm going to pass around a primary resource for you all <laughs> to take a look at. It is a photograph of Love Valley filled circa 1970s. And we can tell that because the picture is imposed on these woodcuts, which are pretty popular in the 1970s. So true, you all were correct. Love Valley has played a prominent role in the social life of West Georgia for many years. The history of Love Valley is shrouded in folklore. The name Love Valley appears for the first time on campus maps in the 1976-1977 college catalog. Love Valley began as a grassy area with, spring, with a spring pred pond used as a watering hole for cattle during the A&M years. In the spring, the school allowed students, faculty, staff, and their families to fish there. While the early use of the pond remains poorly documented through written sources, newspapers reveal that Alpha Psi Omega raised money in 1948 to construct the lake on this site for the improvement of recreational facilities for the students and people of the Carrollton community. The student center was constructed next to this area in 1976. The following year, the university expanded the pond to a new two-fingered lake, which will be 10 times as large and will have a drainage control to keep the lake clear. Love Valley became a refuge where students could escape from the pressures of college life. It was a place for rec rest, recreation, and romantic picnics. During the 1960s and 1970s, Love Valley became the preferred location for outdoor concerts in the spring. However, through the years, the water pipes from surrounding buildings began to cause problems with the water. The college tried to clean out the sludge and to make the pond more appealing by dumping blue dye into the water. The end results of those improvements were ducks with blue feathers. By 1981, the college decided to drain the pond due to water flow problems. Question number two. Why is 1933 important to campus life? <laughs> Shout out what you know. 1933. Yes, you were in the front, sir. That's the year we became a college. That's the year we became a college. Yes, when the colleges were consolidated. Bowden, 7th, and 4th District. Anybody else? There's some more uh, history related to 1933. All right. We became a college. There were clubs, pop publications, and all other things. In the 1920s, the Board of Regents noticed that the three state-supported institutions in West Georgia, the 4th District A&M, Bowdoin College, and the 7th A&M were in close proximity, and they sought to consolidate these schools into one preferred location. The Board of Regents made this decision because they believed that high school education was not efficient enough and argued that organizing into a unified system would be more effective. The 4th District A&M in Carrollton was chosen and opened as West Georgia College in 1933. The 4th District, District A&M was picked because it was in the best location, being in between the other two locations, as well as being close to the state line. The school was now officially a junior college headed by Irvine S. Ingram. In its early years as a junior college, the school began organizing very quickly. The first alumni association was formed in 1933. Men's and women's glee clubs were organized and gave joint concerts on special occasions until they were combined into a single choir in 1940. Written by students for students, the first campus publications related multiple aspects of West Georgia college life, including informing students of upcoming activities, reporting on events that happened in or around campus, and commenting on local, state, and government actions. And reaching out to certain factions on students, of students on campus, such as those associated with the counterculture or civil rights groups. In fall 1933, the West Georgian began, began publication. Historic issues of the West Georgian from 1933 to 2007 will soon be transformed from hard to use microphone filled reels into fully word searchable and fully free online um, digital collections due to the generous support of the Watson Brown Foundation who accepted special collections proposal for digitization. So we'll have the West Georgian online and searchable. The Chieftain, the yearbook for West Georgia College, first appeared in 1934. Last question. 
What year was West Georgia College integrated? Nineteen sixties, I heard sixty nine. Close. Okay. Okay. Sixty three. Close. The nineteen fifty four ruling of the Supreme Court in Brown versus Board of Education stated that the school establishments that were separated based on race were in fact not equal. The senior students from Carrollton's historically black George Washington Carver High School were encouraged by their teacher, Jeff Long, to apply to West Georgia College in 1955 and 1956 and were categorically rejected on account of race. The integration movement wouldn't come to West Georgia College until 1963. West Georgia College's own West Georgia newspaper took the opinions of fellow enrolled students in a piece called School Desegregation Crisis, Your Opinion. Some agreed with the ruling, while others swallowed the integration pill bitterly as they saw the force of change. During the challenges of the 1960s, James E. Boyd acted with a boldness uncharacteristic of many university presidents. Boyd's views on race, student, and faculty freedom of expression were progressive in ways that were not particularly characteristic of a college town in a small southern town in that era. In the summer of 1963, he invited a young black woman, Lillian Williams, to attend West Georgia College, thereby integrating the college without incident and without waiting for a court order. The following year, in May 1964, Boyd invited Robert F. Kennedy to Carrollton for the dedication of the campus chapel as Kennedy Chapel in honor of the late U.S. President John F. Kennedy. In the audience that day was Richard Glanton, who responded to the call for new students by becoming West Georgia's second African-American student in the winter of 1965. Glanton was a part of the varsity debate team and obtained his bachelor's of English in 1968. The college kept the integration quiet, as Miss Williams was a 33-year-old elementary school teacher who was registered to take English and geography during the summer. She continued to attend West Georgia College, obtaining not only her bachelor's in 1967, but her master's degree in 1972. The quiet success of Lillian Williams brought forth movement and continued the slow advancements of adding more African American students. As quoted in a 1993 perspective, the magazine for Alumni and Friends interview, Williams stated, I couldn't ask for a better place to attend college. What was happening with Martin Luther King and the Kennedys was sort of frightening, but I think the people in Carrollton wanted other people to know that we can do things the right way. As more African Americans began to attend West Georgia College, the demand for interaction and inclusion grew. Meetings led by the United Black Student Body demanded more black instructors, black history, more representation, and more jobs. In 1969, the Black Student Alliance was founded with the purpose to promote black awareness and dignity on campus. The 1970s brought a new wave of awareness when West Georgia hosted its flat first weekend for black awareness, which later turned into a week-long celebration. During this week, there are events such as fashion shows and dances, which are organized by BSA. In 1978, Rob Lowe wrote into the West Georgian, and they printed his piece called Black Alienation an op-ed on black students' perspective. Before we get too far deep into the timeline, let's slow down and recount the story of the 4th District a and The institution that is known today as the University of West Georgia came from humble beginnings very early on, from the native lands of the Creek tribe to a plantation and finally to where our entry in the story begins as the 4th District Agricultural and Mechanical School. On 275 acres and under the supervision of J. H. Melson, a 1903 graduate from Mercer University, the 4th District A&M opened its doors on January 8, 1906. The A&M school was a boarding school that stressed agricultural and industrial arts along with the general high school curriculum and was founded to train young white men and women to take their place in a rural agricultural community while providing work opportunities so students can earn most of the money to finance their education. The first day of classes began on a rigid day, on a frigid day. At the time, there were only two buildings, Melson Hall, the boys' dormitory, and the academic building, neither of which were furnished or finished. Alongside the building were areas for farming, an orchard, gardens, pastures, a poultry plant, 
a tennis court and football field. Penelope Melson, Jane Melson's wife, was also aware that the school lacked a library and owned not a single book, moving her to hold a book shower in the community that provided over 375 books for the new school. Even though conditions at the school were not ideal, children from across West Georgia, from Muskegee to Carroll counties, were ready and eager to have an opportunity at higher education. Students worked for their tuition and paid for their room and board, books, and other services such as laundry. While male students worked in agricultural services, female students did domestic duties around campus. The cost for room and board for students living on campus was around a whopping $6.41 per month. And 45% of students paid those expenses by working at the school. Robert Jackson, or Uncle Bob, as the campus family called him, served as the cook, head cook in the A&M days and found favor among students, faculty, and administrators alike. Jack, Jackson's dedication and the admiration felt towards him led to his inclusion in a photograph of the school's 1926-1925 Board of Trustees, which was included in the school's annual bulletin. In 1933, the Board of Regents announced plans to cease the operation of Bowdoin College, which had begun in 1856, and all remaining A&M schools to establish a new junior college on one of three campuses in West Georgia. The choices were Carrollton, Bowden, or Powder Springs. The board chose Carrollton's A&M school as the campus and Irvine S. Ingram as the new president of the college, which they gave the name West Georgia College. In 1937, West Georgia College, with support from the Julius Rosenwald Fund, launched an experimental rural education project that continued for almost a decade and attracted national media attention. The project involved the creation of a cooperative program with the Carroll County Board of Education to provide teaching aids for county schools, a college takeover of a rural school in the Tallapoosa community to supplement its teacher training programs and provide innovative ideas for the entire community, creation of a cooperative program with the Carroll County Board of Education and the Jeans Foundation to study black education in the county at the elementary level, the inauguration of the rural arts life courses, and a study plan for the teaching of English in rural schools. Over a period of 10 years, the fund invested almost $250,000 in West Georgia College. It almost cost President Ingram his job as the then segregationist governor, Eugene Talmadge, was a bitter enemy of the work of the Rosenwald Fund. The renowned artist Norman Rockwell visited West Georgia College and a collection of drawings he made in one of the local schools was featured in the Saturday Evening Post on November 2, 1946. Part of the rural education project involved work in what were then known as the Negro schools. Donetta Sanders, the black supervisor of the Negro schools, regularly met with other personnel and around this time was listed as a faculty member in the college bulletin. Two other faculty members, Robert M. Strozier and Thomas A. Hart, led annual trips to Tuskegee University. Only strong community support, especially that of uh, Governor Ed Eugene Talmadge's sister, Nettie Tyus, from whom our Tyus Hall is named, allowed Ingram to engage in these interracial activities during the era of segregation. West Georgia College's 1945 peti petition to raise its three-year program to a four-year elementary school training program resulted in the Bachelor of Science in Education degree and differences in, of enrollment of non-veteran and veteran students during World War II and the Korean War. This fall, the Center for Public History will host an exhibit at the Bonner House on West Georgia's role in improving the educational resources and opportunities for rural Georgians. From 1930s to 1960s, West Georgia College moved to the forefront of teacher education in the state. The exhibit, Upbuilding Rural Georgia, Education in West Georgia, 1933 to 1969, will invite us to explore the history of rural education in Georgia and West Georgia's steady hand in that essential process. So be on the lookout for that exhibit and information about it. Now we're going to skip a bit ahead, but dive right back into student life and specifically hear about the beginning of Greek life at UWG. In the 1960s, the need arose at West Georgia College for some type of organized social organizations on campus. This need was in direct correlation with a boom in student enrollment. 
Dr. Pershing became Dean of Student Affairs in the fall of 1969 and spearheaded a feasibility study of social Greek organizations in 1968, which culminated in the national affiliation of several new social organizations for students. The social organizations that were established quickly became known as local fraternities and thus having no allegiance or responsibility to a national organization. Most of these local fraternities were started in 1967 through 1968. The most memorable of these local fraternities were Sigma Alpha Omega and the Cavaliers. In January of 1968, the Cavaliers formed to become the first men's local fraternity. On April 29, 1972, the Cavaliers became charted as Pi Kappa Alpha at West Georgia College. Sigma Alpha Omega, led to become Kappa Sigma fraternity on April 2nd, 1971, was not the first local men's fraternity to form, but it was the first nationally recognized men's fraternity chartered at West Georgia College. In 1970, the National Interfraternity Conference today, which is known as the North American Fraternity Conference, or the NIC, was formed on campus because the leadership of these organization colonization meetings began to occur. West Georgia was a much needed recruitment ground for the national organizations that were experiencing a decline in membership during the late 1960s. This decline in membership would continue into the early 1970s as college students were wary of the establishment and many thought the Greek system was outdated and immature. Though, in, though these thoughts in part were due to student attention on most campuses being focused on war, the war in Vietnam and the loss of their classmates. For sororities in the fall of 1967, West Georgia College was greeted by Phi Sigma Delta, the first woman's local sorority to be later chaptered as Delta 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 Fraternity on April 17, 1971. The National Panhellenic Conference quickly followed the lead of NIC in 1970 and descended on the West Georgia campus with a traditional campus colonization plan. I know that word is just prickly, but that's what they refer to in Greek life and began interviewing women to join their national organizations. When all the national organizations became colonies of national organizations, they were required to achieve strict national standards before a charter was granted. This large scale recruitment effort resulted in charters being distributed to seven organizations within 100 days of each other. So Greek life was booming. And it was an exciting time for Greek students because organizations were competing for the chance to be the first national fraternity chartered at West Georgia College. Let's move on to the state of University of West Georgia years. Baruz and Sethna, a native of Bombay, India, became West Georgia's sixth president in 1994 and the first person from an ethnic minority to head a predominantly white or racially integrated state higher educational institution in Georgia. In 1994, Sethna became the sixth president of West Georgia College and he led the school from its transition to university status in 1996. As a result of this charge, Sethna became the first native of India to assume the presidency at a U.S. university. On June 12, 1996, West Georgia was granted university status as the State University of West Georgia and uh, had reached an enrollment of more than 10,000 students. In 1998, the university received approval for its first doctoral program and in June 2004, awarded its first doctoral degree. On January 12, 2005, the Board of Regents voted to rename the institution the University of West Georgia. Under Dr. Sethna's presidency, the institution embraced the motto, educational excellence in a personal environment. In 1998, the university received approval for its first doctoral program. Uh, under Dr. Sethna's leadership, we obtained approval for a classification as a SACS level six institution, its highest certification level, and implemented Georgia's first honor college. This year, we are celebrating the 30th anniversary of UWG Noonan, a place for non-traditional and commuter student stories. Through a cooperative effort by the University of West Georgia, Noonan Coweta Chamber of Commerce, Coweta County Board of Education, and other businesses, civic and edu educational leaders in Noonan and Coweta County, UWG was established and approved by the Board of Regents in 1988. Classes began at the Noonan High School with 15 students in two classes. 
1990, classes moved to the Georgia Power Shenandoah Environment Education Center. In August 2009, UWG held Noonan held a ceremony marking the transfer of ownership of the UWG Noonan property from the Coweta County Commission to the Board of Regents of the University System of Georgia. President Sethna instigated a successful period of expansion that directly impacted the Noonan Center through facility and technology upgrades. Let's talk about more recent history in UWG now. Today, UWG enrolls more than 13,000 students and offers more than 88 programs of study to a vibrant population. The student groups targeted for growth at UWG include traditional students, graduate students, veterans, adult learners, dual enrollment, move on with the ready students, and international students. At UWG, we are building both institutional and community archives that give us the opportunity to challenge the dominant narrative of history and highlight cultural contributions from marginalized and emerging groups. Our diverse cultural backgrounds, religious beliefs, abilities, and other differences influence who we are as individuals, global citizens, and users of information. Although many events have galvanized the West Georgia campus in its 112 year history, it is often difficult to find evidence of student reactions within traditional records of university archives outside of our student newspapers. Documenting student life is one of the greatest challenges faced by university archives in developing our collections. One reason for this is the continuous turnover in students in membership and leadership positions, particularly in campus organizations. Another difficulty with documenting student life is recording the lives of those students who avoid traditional or mainstream student groups and activities. Of the documentation that does exist, the materials that find their way to university archives often come irregularly and unexpectedly. Since most students, unfortunately, have no idea that the archives exist at all, let alone what the archives does, it should not be surprising that this is the case. The university gives us the rare, unique opportunity to serve as ambassadors for the institution at crucial times in the life of, of the college. Exhibitions and community programs that University Archives creates are a model for our, how archives can overcome the, the challenges of community life and the events that are socially relevant to our community by centering students as the creators and characters of those stories. Both of those aspects are key to the student ex exhibitions as they provide a student and alumni voice. So let's talk again about stories as transmitting culture. Students visit special collections with questions about the legitimacy of haunted dorm stories, campus crime statistics, and to simply see what's behind the wooden door on the ground floor of Ingram Library. Campus conversations about the culture and values of UWG reference the creek land on which our campus began, the Bonner Plantation, the experience of African American and LGBTQ plus students over the decades, and how the past work of many student groups strives to accurately reflect student experiences at UWG. Students are curious about whose stories they don't see and why these stories are not represented. We ask ourselves as a result of some of these reference interviews, how can special collections empower students to recreate and highlight unsung histories from our past? The first thing we do in order to overcome some of those challenges is ask what our source is. All archives are incomplete, born of the materials that were valued, saved, and deemed worthy by institutions. Two of West Georgia's most well-known histories are published accounts from alums and staff for who were created uh, for class reunions, departmental anniversaries, and building renovations and retirements and used quite regularly. Those would be the A&M School at Carrollton by Ann Ingram and from A&M to State University uh, by Myron House, J.C. Bonner, and James Matthews. That was created in 1998. Significant events in the history of a university are often diminished over time and relying on collective memory and archival collections to recreate and highlight the past. The Center for Public History has designed courses to reconstruct and interpret our campus legends. Examples of some of these products, which are student content that's under highlighted, are Pushing the Peanut and other traditions building community of West Georgia on the campus 
and this was a fall 2001 class. There is the journey to equality, a reflection on the African American experience from 1906 to 2003, which was created as a part of the fall 2003 intro to public history class. And the most recent edition, the Wolf Track Student Walking Tour created by Dr. Julius Brock, Brock's spring 2016 course, Introduction to Public History. What we do have are student newspapers that allow us to do criti critical investigation alongside some of these other student products. Student publications like the newspaper reflect the scholarship and civic engagement of campus over the past decades. There were five alternative student newspapers written by the West Georgia students between 1967 and 1985, including The Residence, The Paper, The New Paper, The Royken, Puddle, Pacer, and Emoja. Whereas Renaissance is a socialist newspaper created by a group of individuals who believe in the necessity of an alternative press and was focused on the negatives associated with capitalism, The Paper, and its later counterpart, the new paper, portray a countercultural influence through its advocating of abortion rights, sexual freedom, gay rights, protest, and draft dodging in the Vietnam era. Unlike these publications, the Royken Puddle Pusher was written by students who lived in Row Hall and is a comical commentary on the general happenings in the dormitory on, on campus. Umoja is a civil rights publication with the editor being Neil Lester and advisor Emerson Moore. So there are different audiences for these different papers. Student edited and literary art magazine, The Eclectic, was established in 1965. And while it was first published quarterly, Eclectic is now issued only once per year. This annual compilation of creative works featuring poetry, fiction, translations, artwork, film, and music evolves as the student body does. The regular change in staffing due to graduation and course requirements enables a continual refreshing of the viewpoint and a rich diversity of opinion in student presses. In sharing the history of students at UWG, it is critical to give current students and alumni an opportunity to share their personal perspectives and to offer literally a stage upon which to speak about their lives in the context of the university and in the world. Recent events on campuses around the United States and our political climate have highlighted students' concern about understanding our own institutional history. On December 2nd, 2014, five students Deborah Crawford, Kelby Mitchell, Tia Toggle, Jeanne Anise, Aubrey Savage, spontaneously organized a No Justice, No Peace march around the UWG campus in Carrollton, Georgia, as a peaceful protest in response to the killing of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, and to systematic racial injustice. Videos and still images of that march were donated to Ingram Library Special Collections and became central to the idea for an exhibition chronicling the experience of black students at our university. The exhibition African American Black Student Experience at UWG, co-sponsored co by the Center for Diversity and Inclusion and Alumni Relations was on display from February 1st through May 15, 2016. It documented the time of integration in the summer of 1963 and highlighted black student life by decade. Special collections deliberately gathered materials from student organizations and solicited testimonials from alumni and current students about their experiences at UWGT, UWG. While gay and lesbian students were always a part of West Georgia's story, it is not until the early 70s when they gained an active voice. In 1972, the first openly gay faculty member at West Georgia, Ara Destorian, started the first gay rights activist group on campus. At the time, he called it the Students for Gay Education and Awareness, and the organization strived to fight for equal rights for LGBTQ plus people, and to create positive visibility on the West Georgia campus and to improve the lives of LGBTQ people in the campus community. Students for Gay Education and Awareness became Lambda during the 1990s, and that student organization presently still exists. They actually had a movie night with, that they hosted and posted on Twitter last night. 
Live Out, Identity and Activism of Diverse Gender and Sexualities on Campus, curated by Special Collections graduate student Laurel Durham and student volunteer Jazz Lee Coley, in partnership with Lambda, the Responsible Sexuality Committee, and the Center for Public History, draws on historical materials from Ingram Library Special Collections and materials generously loaned by Lambda to tell the part of the story of the student of diverse gender sexualities on campus. The exhibition, which was on display from December 2016 through May 2017, explored why engaging both the LGBTQ community as well as the non-LGBTQ community is vitally important to share experiences, to strive for social and healthcare improvements, prevent bullying and violence, secure freedoms, and promote policies that acknowledge differences and fight invisibility. Collecting materials of current student life is critical to preserving the diverse history of the university. Oral history interviews are one method of documenting the student experience. Speaking with students directly captures their personal perspective on various aspects of student life, such as interpersonal relationships, student organizations, and campus activities. Oral histories complement many of the tradi traditional records that may be already available in the archives, since they often provide context to events described in other records. The interviews offer a deeper and more um, subjective layer of understanding to a college or university's history. Sometimes an oral history will capture an event that would not be found in traditional sources. The LGBTQ Oral History Project has preserved 34 recordings spanning 50 years of UWG history, comprising current students, alumni, faculty, staff, and community members. The project is an effort on the part of the Center for Public History and UWG Special Collection to document the lives of LGBT students, alum, faculty, and staff. The February 2017 program Speak Out brought together interviewees, the community, and allies to share voices from the collection, as well as to discuss present issues currently facing the LGBT community. In spring 2017, former West Georgia College student athlete Lou Davis reached out to Special Collections with a vision to spell, tell sports history through student eyes. The West Georgia 1982 Football National Championship Team Oral History Project will be a recorded conversation between Davis, who was a freshman at the time, and fellow teammates that hopes to shed light on their journey as a team to victory. The prepared questions will guide the 48 to 52 people who participated in the game, including third and fourth strings, as well as their alternates. It will document their recruitment to West Georgia, to tryouts, to campus memories, and to hone memories about some of the major games like Miles College and Orange Bowl leading up to the final win. There is great interest in the history of sports at UWG. Last year, the Center for Public History and Special Collections collaborated on the exhibit Play-by-Play -play Athletics at West Georgia. The exhibit explored student-led development of UWG athletics since the 1900s and how sports transformed university history. The exhibit opened the morning of homecoming and was on display in the Bonner House until April 2017. I'm also asked to lecture regularly on the history of UWG mascots and sports each semester by professors teaching first year seminar and other sports management courses. Yet another effort to create more student sources is YOLO, Your Organization Lives On at UWG, a university archives and records collection project to assist historically black fraternities and sororities with preserving their history of the time at UWG. YOLO is a partner to the university student affairs proposal for a NPHC garden plot and reflection grounds, which was proposed by the UWG Center for Student Involvement last year. Special Collections is especially interested in making sure the experience of NPHC member institutions and African American student life on campus is collected and celebrated. Our first workshop on preserving chapter history was held in September 2017, where I shared two folders from university archives constituting the entirety of NPHC Greek life, which are overshadowed in volume by materials created by members of the College Panhellenic and Interfraternity Councils. We examine gaps in the historical record as reflected in incorrect college yearbook coverage documenting the founding of NPHC organizations on campus. 
We also discussed preserving born digital materials such as flyers and photographs posted on the UWG MPAC Instagram page. We closed the workshop with discussion about how the collection of NPAC history was an effort to establish archival equity and how proper documentation of the, the Divine Nine's history could impact perception of Greek life in and outside the archives and influence campus administration's capacity to understand and support NPHC activities. Later this month, as a part of the scheduled homecoming events, NPHC alumni and current students will gather for a reunion and workshop on preserving Greek paraphernalia and records. The YOLO project, though piloted for NPHC, also welcomes Greek organizations outside this council. The first organization to actually donate to the YOLO project was the Pyro chapter of Delta Zeta, which was installed at UWG in November 2015. They contributed a fall 2015 recruitment t-shirt, Wolf Pride button, uh, agenda meetings, and digital copies of their Citrus Sip newsletter. The most important reason for designing these collection development projects and oral histories is being able to capture and record history as it happens from underdocumented communities. Active documentation is essential to ensure that we record what it means to be a student. Otherwise, the history of the university will remain the story of the administration or a few select students with, without regard to the entire diverse student population the university endeavors to serve. I'm excited to hear what you all will support, how you all will help us support storytelling in university archives and work together with you to figure out how to capture history that shapes our search for community, authenticity, and meaning. I want you to know that myself and the staff of Ingram Library are available to you as a resource. We also want you to be a resource for us. We want you to uh, provide us with information that you seek to find in future years. You've got to share with us historical artifacts that you expect future generations to find. And there are two ways that you can partner with university archives. For either option you would like to pursue, you can begin by contacting me. First is to donate your records to special collections. We can take your records in any format, paper or digital, and we'll make them available as part of our publicly available research collections. This requires you to sign a deed of, a deed of gift officially transferring property to university archives. An example of a donation is this recent record from Tau Kappa Epsilon Fraternity emailed to me after a fraternity and sorority life advisors meeting. The original, this is the original petition sent to key TKE National to be accepted as a charter at West Georgia in 1970, and we did not have this information prior to this donation. Number two, you can learn to preserve your own records. We recognize that while you might be interested in donating, you um, don't have that period of time passed, and uh, many of your members might have graduated from student organizations, and you just need to put stuff together. So we can make sure that you have the skills to preserve your own records on your own so that we, or another archive, your national archive, can easily accept them in the future. We can teach simple paper or digital preservation skills that will ensure your records remain usable for the future. And we can develop a fun hands-on training workshop for your community group. I wanna thank you all for the opportunity to share the history of UWG and offer insight into collecting current student stories for the future. I'm happy to hear your questions, responses, and reflections, especially on your time at West Georgia College, the State University of West Georgia, or the University of Georgia. Thank you. The Macintosh Stone last spring was what's called repatriated back to the Macintosh Reserve, which means it was brought back. We have um, a 3D imaging of the stone that's available online through the Warring Lab before the stone was taken back. Uh, they re-imaged it and we still have all of the 
you know, different logo history and newspaper clippings about the repatriation and how it became the logo in university collections. So that remains a part of the history, but I think it's a good thing that it was taken back to where it originally came from. Yep, his stepping stone to get on his horse. Yes. I have good friends in Bowden, and um, that I have good friends in Bowden, and they still um, are angry <laughs> that uh, Bowden College was closed and moved here. Um, but one thing that you know, Bowden started in 1846, I think it was, and West Georgia in 1906. Why didn't they just adopt the 1846 date as the founding of West Georgia since they combined the two schools? It just sounds so much better to me. Why didn't West Georgia adopt the founding date of the original Bowden High School, which was earlier than the 4th District A&M? Blynn? Blynn is the Bowden College expert. <laughs> yeah, sorry. It's actually because uh, Bowden College was a private institution and not officially part of the network various congressional districts of Georgia. And so uh, technically, we are um, a merging of the fourth and then the seventh district a and schools, the seventh having been in Powder Springs. And so we actually have some traces of the, the seventh district a and school as well in its special collections, but we don't actually, we didn't uh, appropriate the history of Bowden College. We actually have a standalone Bowden College collection uh, and work with Bowden Area Historical Society to preserve those records, but legally, in that sense, we're, we're not um, a successor to Bowden College.